everyone, Anthony Fantano here, the internet's busiest music nerd, and it's time for another Why You Know Review, where I give you guys my thoughts, my opinions on a bunch of albums that have dropped over the past month or so, just kind of talk about them gauntlet style, in brief, because I didn't have the time to review them in a, in a single video, so yeah, they're compacted into this, in all the albums I talk about, listed down below, check them out, cool, let's do it, ba-bam! This new collaboration over here prominently features Pink Sifu, one of the most cutting edge artists in the current field of abstract hip hop, in my opinion. And while his approach is usually subtle, it also tends to trend towards some very abstract out there in left field musical ideas too. And Leather Boulevard over here is definitely far from anything you would call mainstream. While I appreciate that it is going for something different, I felt that the execution and songwriting overall throughout this thing was just too faint, too subtle, just too uh, immaterial. There's very little meat on the bones of this project, in my opinion, as little to nothing on it really left an impression on me outside of the uh, uh, spoken word passages from Atlanta legend Big Rube. And it's awesome he's here, and it certainly says a lot about the legacy and the musical influences that uh, this album speaks to and pulls from. But personally, I feel like they're just embodied in the most unengaging and understated way possible. Here we have the sixth full-length LP from Canada native singer-songwriter Leslie Feist with her indie pop days long behind her and pretty much having accepted uh, that in a very full-throated manner on her last full-length LP. Feist is now heading in more of a folk and singer-songwriter direction this time around with a lot of tracks here that contain combinations of dramatic lead vocals, folk guitar, booming drums, some psychedelic and lush embellishments of vocal harmonies, electric guitar and strings too. It's a record that's detailed and kind of refined in points, but also a little chaotic and ramshackle too, and clearly pulling inspiration from the likes of Bjork as well as uh, Dirty Projectors and maybe a little Tune Yards too, which I think are interesting sounds and artists to uh, pull from. However, I just feel like it's rare that a memorable song translates uh, through the more dense and abstract portions of this record. There are some stunners in the track list, but those tend to be the songs where Feist is at her most frank and direct, be it on the uh, very on the nose hiding out in the open or the Red Wing, as well as the closer song for Sad Friends. Because, yeah, to put it bluntly again, I just think this record loses at least some potency in its more abstract bits. However, if you've been riding with Feist up until this point, it's definitely a record worth listening to. Uh, one of the more interesting singer songwriter offerings of the year. <laughs> Portland Neo Psych Outfit Unknown Mortal Orchestra is back with their fifth full length LP. I wasn't really crazy about the singles on this one, so honestly, I went into it kind of worried I was going to hear a mess, a lot like the uh, uh, reggae fusion nightmare that is the song Layla. Plus, this is the band's longest album and the longest gap in album releases that we've seen from them so far. And yeah, overall, I'm feeling pretty cold on this release. Not that I've ever been the biggest fan of the band anyway, so uh, I guess very little love lost, and uh, their fans probably don't expect me to go crazy for this record anyway. But I will say this, there are a handful of songs on this thing that are more or less instrumental jams, and oddly, I feel like that's where the record is at its most interesting and enchanting. The band is sounding super tight, the grooves, the bass, the drums are fantastic, the guitar passages and melodies are pretty. But past that, I just don't think the band is in their songwriting bag on this one, at least not in the way uh, that they were on multi-love a while ago. Plus the vocals for me with UMO just continue to be a weak point. Uh, these very raspy falsettos tend to give me ear fatigue after a while, especially on tracks where they're mixed very aggressively, like on That Life. Plus there are moments on this thing such as Meshuggah that I think are just too lo-fi for their own good. Uh, while I do love a lot of lo-fi music and I find lo-fi as an art form to be uh, pretty intriguing, I just rarely find uh, these left field recording and production methods employed with UMO in a way that feels adventurous, groundbreaking, out there in search of some kind of you know unique sonic palette. More or less the band's approach to lo-fi for me just kind of ends up leaving things sounding very dull and maybe a bit too fuzzy. 
R&B singer and songwriter Chloe Bailey is coming through with her debut record over here, splitting away from her sister, which I think is a bit of a shame because I think uh, musically they had kind of a unique thing going as a duo for a bit. But I'm sure her sister is kind of busy with the whole Little Mermaid thing right now, and Chloe clearly uh, has her heart in music at the moment, or, or rather in, in her hand. Either way, for whatever reason we are at this point with this record, I think the um, decision to go solo may have been a little premature because now what we have here is a really derivative focus group record that has no direction, no vision, just feels like it is uh, digging for a hit and trying to please everybody. There are tons of weak and very stereotypical song ideas across the record as well, like cheat back and so many vocal performances. And with R and B, you're kind of living and dying by the vocal performances. Uh, th they're just living in the shadow of Beyonce in the most unflattering way. Yeah, sad to say I'm just not crazy about it. Indie scene vets Deerhoof are back uh, with a brand new LP that is uh, uh, being angled as uh, having been sung entirely in Japanese. But sadly, I don't think this switch has led to uh, the aha moment that uh, the record's promotion kind of implied. If there's anything truly defining about this LP, in my opinion, uh, it's that instrumentally and melodically, this is a very tense and moody one for Deerhoof. The playful attitude and quirky bits of guitar and absurd lyrics that uh, made so many classic Deerhoof records up until this point, uh, they're just not present here. They've been replaced with keys and very sour, uh, but weepy guitars that I just don't think are as evocative as they'd like to be because this record, yes, while it is in a mood, I'm not sure the band's performance style and production being as raw as it is, uh, is complementary to the direction this record is heading in. Often it sort of adds a lot of edges in places where they don't need to be. Now, there are some moments where the softer approach goes over well and it works like on the very jazzy ballad uh, the little maker and there are a few exhilarating bangers in the track list as well like a momentary r of soul as well as and the moon laughs but to be honest i'm kind of at a loss with the rest of the lp especially uh the tracks in the first half the closer as well where i don't think greg gives the strongest vocal performance either <laughs> While I was looking forward to this one, I'm just not crazy with the results, sadly. This Brooklyn producer and songwriter uh, kind of takes her very light and airy voice and places it on a series of ambient and glitchy pop instrumentals that are a weird combination of underwhelming but also grating, despite being as soft and as carefree as they kind of come off as being on the surface. The pillowy beauty and genuine fun of uh, some of the early EP work that we've heard from this project is is uh, just not here, it's evaporated and has been replaced with something that feels a lot more robotic and faceless, emotionally flat. I wouldn't say the songs on this thing are all that catchy either, despite them being as upfront as they are, which again, uh, weird and surprising because I, I thought she really had it uh, in the bag on this one. <laughs> This new record is from a North Carolina band that's been active since 2018, dropping record after record. And with this new one over here, uh, they seem to be turning more heads than they ever have before. However, listening to it myself, I'm kind of scratching my head as to why. I mean, it's certainly not terrible. Uh, the band seems to have a versatile array of influences and can pull off slacker rock tracks just as well as they can alt country tracks and at points fuse the two a little bit. But with that being said, I don't think they do either with all that much personality and the vocals are also maybe one of the most forgettable things about the band's overall sound even on relatively ambitious moments like the eight minute bull believer so overall for me this thing is not awful but it's not stopping me in my tracks either for what it is i suppose it's fine okay okay i want to see everyone in the crowd sing the words to this one open up this pit Motherfucker! I don't have the strength in me to hear a word you say. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. Vocals are killer. I mean, if if you like metalcore, you'll like it. 
Okay, this is the fourth formal full-length LP from this Netherlands band known for uh, vintage reworks of classic Turkish songs. And in my opinion, it kind of rocks. The synth work and guitar work is a lot better than what I've heard on previous records from them. And the band is sounding especially tight this time around too, as they're jamming. Their production continues to bring this old school nostalgic feel to the table. But this time around, I think they do a really amazing job of uh, again, kind of recapturing something that feels old, but it doesn't kill uh, the sound or richness or texture of the instrumentation. I think this record's full of some pretty cool renditions, but, uh, you know, it, it's it's kind of hard to hype it up uh, with it being, in, in a sense, like a, a, a covers act or a tribute act. And I was kind of hoping they would offer something a bit newer in terms of like a sound this time around, especially since they dabbled in so much synth pop on their last record. But yeah, this thing has a fun series of exotic jams on it that I think are a must listen if you, you know, like psychedelic and vintage rock music. <laughs> I was pretty psyched to dig into this debut LP from Minnesota punk-ish outfit MS Paint. I think this record brings a really bold sound that fuses elements of uh, synth punk and punk rock, hardcore and hip hop. This thing is heavy, it's loud, it's in your face, it's hype, but it's also kind of one dimensional too. The vocals, synths, bass, and drums come together in a way that is is unlike anything I've heard from any other rock outfit in 2023. But the band Orbit around this sound in such a strict way, it doesn't leave them a lot of creative wiggle room to try other things or, you know, explore other moods or levels of intensity, instrumental palettes, which, um, you know, was kind of surprising considering uh, there was at least a bit more versatility going for them on their 2020 EP a while back. So I think this record's got a lot of guts, a lot of heart, a lot of energy, some bangers on it here and there, but uh, I don't know, maybe I'll wait for some more versatility on the next one. New Hit Boy record. And honestly, I'm kind of surprised because this guy is a legendary beat maker. He comes through with a producer curated project, and it is so not the fireworks show that you would hope from somebody with his level of talent and his profile. Throughout this thing, there's a lot of bland, smooth trap instrumentals when oh, he, you, you know he can make these kinds of beats in his sleep, he, he's capable of so much more, especially what we've heard as he's worked with artists like Nas. And the Nas crossover on this record is good. Uh, the Alchemist one is great too, but believe me when I tell you, there's really nothing else on this record that is uh, worth writing home about, honestly. <laughs> Ice Cold Bishop is a West Coast rapper with a pretty decent debut here that shows him taking on a lot of social issues. We have focused song topics, creative production on this thing as well, and some wild vocal inflections too. Some of this dude's high notes are going to make you turn your head, raise an eyebrow, but I will say the level of flow and lyricism he brings does take the edge off of the weirdness a bit. Now, I did leave some songs on this record feeling like the commentary didn't dig quite deep enough, but maybe the Achilles heel of this LP, in my opinion, are just all of the constant Kendrick Lamar deja vu moments throughout the project, which just makes it very distracting to listen to. Whether it comes to flow, harmonies, vocal layering, and inflection, this guy's like really studied Kendrick's craft and, and has done it very closely, maybe too closely, maybe to the point where he needs a, a wider array of influences to pull from. And uh, while, again, it seems like a lot of talent and effort went into this project, I hope we do kind of, you know, maybe get a, a wider scope of sounds on the next record. Sophomore effort here from Portland Black and Speed Metal Outfit Spirit Possession, a band that has a uniquely intense and chaotic sound, not just because of their ultra speedy riffs and tempos and demonic lead vocals, but also those vocals are uh, usually soaked in this very prominent repeating echo, not reverb, echo, 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 which for a genre like black metal being as chaotic and as dense as it is, is uh, sort of unusual, makes kind of a big difference especially when you're delivering vocals that are as harsh and as throaty as this. So again, it's a bold and instantly recognizable sound. Uh, I mean, this record in so many ways sounds a lot like the band's last one, but maybe a bit more heavy and clearer. But I think this style Spirit Possession has going for them, they don't really do much on this LP to break it up or explore or expand its uh, potential. And it just kind of leaves the entire record feeling uh, kind of one-dimensional because by the time you hit the third track, you kind of get the point. So while there 
there's a lot of musicianship and speed and intensity going into this LP. Uh, I would hope that the band would find just kind of new ways to approach things uh, on the next one. Owl City? More like owl shit. Bruiser Brigade rapper Z Loopers is back, microphone fiend over here. And I was kind of hoping for some fun and memorable tracks from this project, but it's really just a like a low grade mixtape type level of, uh, you know, uh, showing here. Definitely a drop in eccentricity, energy, and songwriting focus from uh, Van Gogh's Ear, which was kind of his last project that really grabbed a lot of attention. While Z Loopers is still definitely more eccentric than your average rapper out there today, I still think he's not fully tapping into his potential at this moment. And I think the song structuring, song writing, and uh, much of the time the lyricism kind of shows it. Zition, have you given any of these albums a listen? Did you love him? Did you hate him? What would you rate him? You're the best. You're the best. What should I review next? Hit the like if you like. Please subscribe and please don't cry. Hit the bell as well. Over here next to my head, another video you can check out. Hit that up with the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano, why you know review of forever.